We're going to have Atma Vimalakanda now discuss uh, lattice retinal degeneration. Hello, and I'd like to thank the committee and the academy for allowing us to do this today. Uh, again, my name is Atma Vimalakanda. I'm one of the retinal surgeons just south of here at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation. I do have one financial interest to disclose, but is unrelated to this talk. So let's first start with the case. Uh, so this was a 26-year-old asymptomatic phacic patient uh, referred for retinal evaluation, no posterior vitreous detachment, and then this is the exam that we saw. So if I can go back to my resident and fellow days, I would say this is a color fundus photograph of the left eye, the media are clear, the optic nerve, retinal vessels, and macula look intact. If you draw attention in the first photo to the infratemporal periphery, you'll see these ovoid pigmented areas, some with retinal holes. And then if you go to the second photo, superiorly and supertemporally, you'll see again the, this ovoid area, some with pigment, some with white lattice-like lines. And so what should we do with this patient? Well, of course, we're talking about lattice retinal degeneration. Uh, you knew that when you walked in, um, but nonetheless, it's important to review some of these points. It's a vitreoretinal degenerative process that predisposes to retinal tear and detachment. Uh, approximately 20 to 30 percent of patients with regmatogenous retinal detachment have lattice degeneration, and it's present in about 6 to 8 percent of the population. But if you switch your perspective to that of the individual patient with lattice, they have a less than 1% chance of having a retinal detachment in their lifetime. What are some of the findings that we see? Again, it's a peripheral vitreoretinal condition characterized by being often ovoid with the long axes running parallel to the aura serrata. Uh, there's retinal thinning with overlying vitreous liquefaction, and there tends to be firm vitreoretinal adhesions at the margins of the thinning. What I'm trying to show in this photo is the supranasal kind of overlying vitreous uh, on top of this lattice. And again, if you take these together, you have a patient with thin retina, sticky vitreous. When that vitreous begins to pull away, as Dr. Edelman so um, nicely spoke about, you have a perfect storm for a possibility of a retinal tear. So this is our first patient again, the 26-year-old, and we see that round holes occur frequently within areas of lattice retinal degeneration. And if I can, uh, there it is. So again, we're talking about these small atrophic holes. And the key thing to pay attention to on exam is, are those flat? Uh, do they have any subretinal fluid associated with them? Uh, and then we'll talk more about that. Lattice has many morphologies, so most of the examples that I've shown you thus far have been pigmented of some sort or another. And what I'm trying to show here is that not all lattice has to be pigmented. So if you look at the posterior edge here, this is what I'm talking about in terms of this snail tract degeneration. As its name implies, perivascular lattice is typically found adjacent to retinal blood vessels. And so again, if you follow the blood vessel, you'll see that just next to it, there's this area of lattice retinal degeneration. And again, if the vitreous pulls away from the retina in this area and can tear the retina, you can imagine that that blood vessel could be torn as well. Special consideration must be given to radial lattice. Uh, as it has a much higher risk of retinal detachment than circumferential lattice. And again, I'm not sure if this will project, but if you look at the posterior edge of this radial lattice, which again is perivascular, you can see a horseshoe tear just there. So what is the risk of progression? Do we have any data? And so there was a really great clinical study done by Dr. Beyer in which he followed 423 eyes with lattice retinal degeneration over 10 years. At the outset of the study, 150 had atrophic holes. 10 patients had holes with more than one disc diameter of subretinal fluid, which we would consider a subclinical retinal detachment. And over the 10 years, he found that six patients developed subclinical retinal detachments. Three patients developed clinical retinal detachment. So again, these data indicate that patients with lattice retinal degeneration with or without retinal holes are at very low risk for progression to clinical retinal detachment without a previous regmatogenous retinal detachment in the fellow eye. And then if I can do a little aside, um, again, gratitude to Dr. Beyer. He was a private practice retinal surgeon in LA, and through his clinic, he was able to follow his patients and give us a lot of great detail and a lot of great data that we can then make clinical decisions upon. So again, these aren't all of his papers. These are just the ones that seemed appropriate. <clears throat> 
So let's move on. Second case, now this is a 66-year-old established patient with new onset flashes and floaters in the right eye following cataract surgery, and they have a new posterior vitreous detachment. So here is the color photo. Again, you can see the Weiss ring there. And then if you look at the exam, you'll see that this retinal hole, which you had seen previously, now has enlarging subretinal fluid associated with that hole. So what should we do in this instance? Well, in patients like this, prophylactic treatment should be considered when the detachments are documented to increase in size or show signs of progression. Patients with round holes need careful follow-up visits and must clearly understand the symptoms of progression. Because again, small localized retinal detachments may develop and enlarge to become clinical retinal detachment, although the risk is low. And so again, what I tell my patients is that although the risk is low, it's not zero, and so we have to pay attention and you need to know what to watch out for and when to call me. More commonly though, regmatogenous retinal detachment occurs in eyes with lattice retinal degeneration when a posterior vitreous detachment induces a horseshoe tear. So again, color photo, you see the Weiss ring, and then temporally, you'll see the horseshoe tear. And at the apex of the flap, you'll see that lattice. And so this is the more common cause for retinal detachment in patients with lattice. What do we do about patients who have lattice in the fellow eye? Uh, as we know, lattice degeneration occurs bilaterally in about 45% of patients. Should we treat asymptomatic lattice prophylactically in the contralateral eye of a patient who has suffered a lattice retinal degeneration associated detachment? What's the data on this? And in this instance, we have great data from Master Pasqua and his group. They looked at, uh, prospectively, 150 consecutive patients with unilateral regmatogenous retinal detachment with high-risk features in their fellow eye over the course of 36 to 132 months. This is a busy slide, but I'll walk you through it. Uh, they did prophylactic treatment in the presence of retinal tears and lattice retinal degeneration in about 100 eyes. 95 of whom got laser, and these were to tears in lattice uh, with micro holes, and 88%, about 84 eyes, had symptoms, meaning flashes, floaters, or both, prior to treatment. And they actually buckled five of these eyes, and these were patients who had much more severe pathology, meaning multiple retinal degenerations over 90 degrees, retinal dialysis, giant retinal tears, multiple retinal tears in several quadrants, retinal tears with evident traction, or large tears that either had rolled edges, meaning PVR, or localized subretinal fluid surrounding the tear, meaning a subclinical retinal detachment. 100% uh, of these patients had a posterior vitreous detachment, but only 42% had complete PVD. And as Dr. Edelman mentioned, it can be difficult to tell, and so they pulled out all the stops, meaning they did Goldman 3 mirror at the slit lamp, they did indirect ophthalmoscopy with 360 degree scleral depression, and then they also did A-scan and B-scan ultrasound to stage these posterior vitreous detachments. So what happened in the prophylactic group? So of the 100 eyes that were treated, 10 eyes, only in the laser group, developed retinal detachment during the follow-up period. In half of these cases, a partial PVD progressed and a retinal tear in a previously healthy area was the cause of the retinal detachment. In the other five cases, the retinal detachment developed from previously treated lesions. We think that the progression of uh, the posterior vitreous detachment was evident in four of these five cases. And in four of the five cases, the laser ended up limiting the extension of the detachment, but it did not prevent the detachment. And so what about the observation group? So the untreated eyes, there were 50. None had visible retinal tears or degenerative lesions at the beginning of the study, and none had posterior vitreous detachment uh, at the beginning of the study. Over that follow-up period, eight eyes developed retinal detachment, and all showed partial posterior vitreous detachment at the time the retinal detachment was diagnosed. So what are our arguments for and against? Well, the pro side is that estimated retinal detachment risk in the contralateral eye could be around 5%. Depending on the literature, most people agree it's somewhere between 4 and 14%. If you look at other data, um, especially from retinal centers, the risk is listed as high as 35%, but we think that there's a little bit of a referral bias there. Uh, and then 
Could it be that prophylactic therapy possibly reduces the risk in certain patients? Again, it's possible. In the Master Pasqual article, we saw that while it did not prevent detachment, it did limit detachment in four of uh, 10 cases. So could there be some benefit there? What about the downsides? Well, there's no consensus guidelines. Uh, and then we know already that fellow eyes with lattice retinal degeneration, pre-existing retinal tears, and posterior vitreous detachment can go on to retinal detachment despite laser prophylactic treatment. And then per buyer's data, it's reasonable to consider most fellow eye retinal detachments as unpreventable events. In his work, about 58% of tears and retinal detachment showed no visible vitreoretinal pathology prior to developing the tear. So we'll finish with one last case. So here's a 54-year-old gentleman with new floaters in his right eye, and I saw him just uh, a few months ago. His left eye had had a lattice retinal degeneration-related detachment in 2005, and so he underwent laser prophylaxis to the right eye, the unaffected eye, in 2005 that same year. So 2005, laser to lattice. 2019, he had a posterior vitreous detachment-related horseshoe retinal tear and retinal detachment that was not seen prior. It was in normal retina. And so again, the prophylaxis in this case did not seem to prevent his retinal detachment. So to sum up, our final take home here, again, lattice retinal degeneration is a vitreoretinal degenerative process that predisposes to retinal tears and detachment. It's associated with a much, uh, radial lattice is associated with a much higher risk of retinal detachment than circumferential lattice. Regmatogenous retinal detachment in lattice generally occurs when a posterior vitreous detachment induces a horseshoe tear. Patients with round holes need careful follow-up visits and must clearly understand the symptoms of progression. And in these patients, prophylactic treatment should be considered when the detachments are documented to increase in size and show signs of progression. And then finally, there are no consensus guidelines for prophylactic laser to the asymptomatic fellow eye of a patient who has suffered a lattice-associated retinal detachment. So we suggest clinical judgment. Thank you so much. And then with the last few minutes, I just wanted to say when I was a resident and a fellow, I relied upon these. And then when I was faculty, I used these preferred practice patterns to teach my residents and fellow. And now it's super gratifying to be part of the committee that puts these things together. So thanks so much for the opportunity.